going forward. And um, so no announcements on that front. Uh, any uh, uh, prayer requests that we might have tonight? Anything at all? Anything at all? Nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. All right, then nothing new. All right, that's a good thing, I guess. All right, so uh, let's begin then as we normally do. Uh, we begin with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to use First John 1 John 1.9, the rebound technique, which is the confession of our sins, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, because it's a cleansed vessel that God works with. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word. And Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to serve and worship you as we walk in your will and your plan. And we thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us, providing for all of our physical and spiritual needs, your Son, Jesus Christ, your Holy Spirit, your great plan for our daily walk, our gift, uh, the ministry and the effect that you've given to us. We can't thank you enough, Father, for all that you have done for us and our families, and especially for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. And so, Father, we uh, praise you and worship you and glorify you for all that you do, and we ask that you continue to pour out your blessings onto us this day and in the coming days as well as we continue to walk in your will and in your plan. And Father, we pray for our nation this day. We ask that you be with our president, that you lead and guide him in all his decision-making authority to honor your word in your divine establishment principles and our Constitution. Also, our congressmen and senators and uh, Supreme Court, uh, local governors and mayors and selectmen, councilmen and women, whatever the case, we just pray for each and one, every one of them that you've put in office. We thank you, Father, for their service and for their sacrifice, and we ask that you lead them also to make good and wise decisions that are truthful and honest and just, that honor your word and divine establishment principles, and also our constitutions. And Father, we also pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world, and our policemen and our firemen here at home as well. And we ask that you protect and guide each and every one of them and keep them safe in all their endeavors, and we thank you for their service and their sacrifice. And especially for the police in our country, Father, we pray for them and allow them to be appreciated and for people to come to their senses and understand the necessity of having a good, strong police, uh, keeping crime and uh, evil out that is always there. And so, Father, we just pray for all of those men and women uh, in our armed forces, uh, both here at home and around the world, and give them strength in all that they do each and every day and protect and guide them, and especially Zach and Jeff. We pray for them and keep them protected in all that they do. And Father, we also pray for all the pastors and missionaries and evangelists that we may be aware of in all the churches within our country. We pray for them that they teach the truth of your word, and especially the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, and that you provide for their every need so that uh, the churches are continuing to be strong in your word and continue to go forward as we also send out missionaries and evangelists here at home and around the world. And Father, we also uh, pray for those people in uh, California who are being uh, subjected to the various fires and also in Colorado, and we pray for them and ask that healing and recovery be had and the firemen working out there as well and ask that those fires come under, uh, 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 under the, uh, calm down and uh, be uh, put out as soon as possible according to your will. And we also pray for uh, those recovering from the storm in Iowa, especially uh, Jody and uh, Titus Thompson. We pray for them for healing and recovery according to your will and also... Uh, those down in Louisiana are about to be hit by uh, the second hurricane. Uh, we pray for them and that all goes well in during that time. And Father, we also uh, pray for Mrs. Wenstrom and the Wenstrom family, and we ask for uh, her continued uh, uh, walk and uh, uh, the family to make good and wise decisions about her health care. And also we thank you for Bob Fuller's recovery, and we continue to pray for my mother and her eyes and eye surgeries. We pray for Peg and uh, Sherry, and we ask that uh, you continue to heal and recover them and uh, have them in, in, in uh, your hand. Also, be with Amy and her shoulder in an upcoming surgery next week, and Tom and his eye surgery in the coming weeks as well. And we ask for all of those on our prayer list, especially Jess and her pregnancy. We pray for all of them, Father, and ask that you uh, work mightily in their life and allow healing and recovery according to your will and strength and guidance by your word and by your spirit. Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you have your hand upon our service this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen. <coughs> All right, and if Cheryl, I guess, will come forward and uh, lead us in our doxology.
God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know, he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. All right, thank you very much for the doxology. And now I'll turn our Bibles. Let's go to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Luke, chapter 14. And in the Gospel of Luke, we're talking about uh, being disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we're going to read, again, a large crowd was following him. And uh, uh, knowing that all of them weren't true followers of him, in other words, they didn't believe in him, they were only looking for the miracle or what they could get out of him, and they truly weren't disciples, he turned to the crowd and then gave this lesson on what it means to be a disciple and also the cost of being a disciple. And that's what we've been noting over the last couple of sessions, and that's what we're going to uh, note this evening. It begins in verse 25 and goes all the way through verse 35, which is the last message in chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke. So let's just read that, and uh, uh, tonight we're going to pick up on uh, one of the two object lessons that Jesus Christ gives in regard to counting the cost of being a disciple. Now in verse 25 it says, Now great multitudes were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate, and again we talk about uh, having in lesser priority than Jesus, his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And so again, in verse 27, and carrying your cross, we talked about that. And most people just want to think of the trials and tribulations of what they have to go through from time to time and the real difficult moments of their lives as the carrying their cross. But as we noted on Sunday, carrying your cross is doing the everyday things of the ordinary to live the spiritual life and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as it says here, to think less of your family, not to think less necessarily or have them in lesser priority, as it were, and not be giving over to their demands and the demands of the world or the demands of this or that one. Instead, following Jesus Christ and making him as the A number one priority, that is truly carrying your cross, making God your first priority by taking in his word and ultimately following him on a daily basis as you live that word and apply it within your life. Now we have in verse uh, 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 28, and 29, the first object lesson, and then uh, also verse 30. And that's what we're going to note this evening. And we have a specific uh, uh, understanding of what these passages are all about with a lesson involved. And then in the second object lesson, we see a different aspect as well. So it says in verse 28, it says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and it is and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Then the second object lesson is verse 31. It says, or what king, when he goes out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel, whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, why, or, or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegate and asks terms of peace. So therefore, no one 
of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And then in uh, verse 34 and 35, Therefore salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? And then in verse 35, It is useless either for the soil or the manure pile, dung heap sometimes in translations, it is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. Uh, he who has ears, let him hear. All right? So that's the object lesson that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives about being disciples, really talking about giving up all things. And we have one object lesson about building a tower. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the king going out into battle. We'll talk about that on Thursday night. That does have to do with, again, analogy, or by analogy, the angelic conflict. But today we're just talking about building that tower analogy and recognizing that we have enough to build a strong tower and what that means. So as we see here in verses 28 through verse 32, we have those two analogies. Both of them are talking about the, the cost of a disciple and having a calculation in your mind's eye as to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in regard to giving up other things in life, sometimes the giving up is just a mental, giving it up, making it a less priority. Other times it's giving it up completely. Again, if you can't deal with it mentally, then you have to give it up wholeheartedly, completely. And that reminds us when the rich young ruler came to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and said, how must I be saved? And ultimately Jesus said, go and sell all your possessions and come follow me. Did he literally have to sell all his possessions to follow Jesus Christ? Well, in his case, probably yes, because he couldn't just give it up men mentally and say, these things aren't a priority in my life. They're good. They're nice. I'm blessed with them. But my main objective in life is to follow Jesus Christ. And these things aren't really important to me, even though I have them. But for the rich young ruler, they were overwhelming his soul. So he had to get rid of those things and give them up and then come follow Jesus. So again, another aspect of discipleship that Jesus spoke about in a parable format. But here talking about uh, being prepared by calculating the cost of what it means to be a disciple. And are you ready to give up all for the sake of following Jesus Christ? And that's really what this is all about. And so we see this in the analogy of a building of a tower. Let's go back to verse 28. It says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? And again, in the Greek, I've given that in your notes. I uh, don't have it on the board, but it's pergos. And what's interesting about this word in this tower is that typically this type of tower would be built in a vineyard. So we're talking about a vineyard here, okay? The place, you know, where things are growing and you would go out and, you know, uh, till the land and grow things and then harvest and then have great bounty. And they used to build these towers in these uh, vineyards back in the day for protection and also to bring in the harvest as well. So they would sometimes defend their vineyard by building a tower and then also have a place where they could dwell during the harvest time as it were. So we see this being a, a place of refuge. We see it being a place of strength. So by understanding what this type of tower is back in the ancient day, it tells us a little bit about the analogy that Jesus Christ is bringing forward. To be a disciple of his, we have to have a strong tower in the mentality of our soul. We have to have a strong tower power inside of us, as it were, what, what was what we call the edification complex of your soul. In other words, your heart and your soul have to be strong, filled with Bible doctrine, filled with the Word of God, and being worked on and performed and utilized each and every day. And that's what's going on here, that they would have the management of defense of their, uh, or the management of their property and the defense of their property. Just as the Word of God gives you the ability to manage your soul so that the sin nature doesn't take control, so that it doesn't overwhelm you on a consistent basis. And then also to defend that property from that same enemy called the sin nature, so it doesn't overwhelm you and lead you astray. 
So when we talk about this tower that he's talking about here, we see a lot of great analogies from the original uh, utilization of this back in the ancient Near East as they would build these towers in their vineyard. And again, you could say the vineyard is your soul and the tower is that edification complex of the soul. Again, building up the soul to spiritual adulthood with spiritual maturity, being strong in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in fact, the word for build there, which is oiko domeo, and in that word it does mean to build, but it also means to edify as well. So to build and to edify, and also to strengthen and encourage, or even to erect something. So we see that going on. And who has to calculate the cost? Each individual believer. How am I going to build up my soul? That's what this is all about. You see, as we've talked about, remember the backdrop of all of this is that salvation is a free gift from God. And through faith, faith we have salvation when we believe in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for our sins. But as we've been noting and saying throughout this, even though salvation is free, discipleship has a cost. And we have to recognize what the cost is to build up our soul so that we can be the true disciple of Jesus Christ that he wants us to be. And what does that cost? Well, again, we have the priority of carrying our cross, being, you know, heroes in the mundane or the ordinary of everyday life, to live the spiritual life, not live by the ways of the world, but to live according to the word of God. Also, it means giving up other things so that we can come and learn the word of God so that we do build up our soul with the knowledge of Bible doctrine and then our strength to go forward each and every day. So that's what we're doing as we're gathered together here this evening. We are building up our soul with the Word of God. We're building up the edification complex of the soul. Again, just another way of saying strengthening our soul with the Word of God and Bible doctrine so that we can grow to spiritual adulthood. And as it says here, our Lord says, first, you must calculate. Calculate what that means. In other words, do the calculation, do the figuring, do the math in your head, as it were, or do the counting. In other words, do the reconciling within your mind's eye as to what it's going to take to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then once you recognize that, now walk on that path. And understand there are certain things or uh, avenues of your life that you have to give up so that you can follow Jesus Christ, so that you can learn about Jesus Christ and go forward inside of his plan. And ultimately... As I said before, it, we have to first try to give them up mentally and do that by not making them a priority over our relationship with Jesus or over our opportunity to serve God, learn his word, and apply it within our life. And if we can't do it mentally, then we have to do it physically. Remove ourselves from a sinful situation so that ultimately we can go forward in the plan of God where it's not negatively affecting the mentality of our soul. Give it up. Or sometimes remove ourselves from our family if necessary. And again, doesn't mean you divorce your family. But what does it mean is that you just have to make God a priority in your family. It's not like these crazy things. Remember back in the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of kids trying to divorce their parents. Do you remember that on the news? And they're trying to emancipate themselves because they didn't want to be disciplined by their parents anymore. No, that's not what we're talking about here, okay? You can't divorce yourself from your family, okay? And husbands and wives shouldn't divorce themselves so that somebody can go follow God, okay? That's not the plan of God. But what this means is that separation from the mentality of your soul in making Jesus the A number one priority, making him first and foremost the A number one priority so that we can build our soul with the word of God consistently, again, brick by brick, layer by layer. And unfortunately, when we go back to the Old Testament and the, remember the phrase line upon line, precept upon precept, sounds like a good thing, but in the application of that particular verse, ultimately was talking about uh, the apostles of the Israelites. But the good part of it is that the true Israelite and the true believer is building their soul line upon line, precept upon precept. Word by word, we take in Bible doctrine and we build our soul up with the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if we are going to build our soul up with the Word of God, we have to calculate the cost so that we can make sure that we do what? Complete it. And that's what this is all about. You see, Jesus Christ wasn't just saying, get into the race, but then, you know, if you start to get tired, go sit down on the sideline and catch your breath or something like that. No, he's saying, get into the race and keep running until you win. 
And that's what this is all about, calculating the cost so that we can achieve the end goal of whatever that plan that God has for our life. Whatever the race is, complete the race. If it's a 5K, run enough for the 5K. If it's a 10K, run a 10K. If it's a marathon, run the marathon. And make sure that you are prepared to run the 5, 10, or marathon, which is 28 miles, I believe, 20. 26 points, something or other. All right, yep, miles to, to, to uh, complete. Make sure you've got the right resources so that you can fulfill that race that you've entered into. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've entered into salvation. We've entered into the family of God. We've become a royal priest and a royal ambassador. Now that we've been entered into that, we need to calculate what it means to complete that within our life. Now, Jesus Christ had a plan for his life, as we talked about the last couple of days, and in, in, uh, especially on Sunday, about carrying your cross. God's plan for Jesus Christ was for him to go all the way to the cross, and that was the completion of God's plan for his life, his death, burial, uh, resurrection, and ascension. That completed his human life here on planet Earth. That fulfilled God's plan for his life as a member of the human race. God also has a plan for your life, whatever that may be. And again, we don't have to be martyred to carry our cross. And, you know, uh, you know, frankly, the majority of Christians will not be martyred in their spiritual walk, nor does God call for it. Okay, so don't be looking for the martyrdom in order to fulfill the plan and carry the cross. But what it is, is whatever God's plan is for you to go forward with your spiritual gift in the ministry that he's given to you with the effect that he has provided for you and go forward until the day is done when you're either taken out through death or the rapture. Continue to keep walking faithfully each and every day and getting better and better and better every day as you put God as your priority more and more each and every day. Fulfill the plan, complete the race. We're going to see those passages in just a minute. Now, what's interesting about this word, calculate, I give this to you in your notes, and it's a sophiso, if I pronounce that correctly, in the Greek language, it means count, calculate, or figure. Now, what's interesting about this word, that it's only used here and one other place in the New Testament. And guess where that one other place in the New Testament is? In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, that talks about recognizing the mark of the beast. Isn't that interesting? Okay? And I'll tell you why. So let's just read it here. Here is wisdom. All right, so right off the bat, here is wisdom. Jesus Christ is giving us wisdom. Calculate the cost of what it means to be a disciple of his. And it says, let him, uh, let him who has understanding. So again, we see knowledge, understanding, discernment. And then what does it say? Calculate. Calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. And again, you're probably all very familiar with the number 666 and that being the mark of the beast and how that is going to be portrayed during the tribulation, either on the hand uh, or on the forehead that people are going to have to wear, like a tattoo or uh, uh, some other aspect. People, a lot of people think the chip is going to be that thing. All right, But what the Bible tells us is that it's the name of a man that gets translated into numerics that equate to 666. So in the end times, times, it's not just going to be a, a, a chip that's going to be in your hand, but it's going to be somebody's name. Whose name? The Antichrist's name that you're going to have to wear on your hand or on your forehead, maybe some kind of technology with tattooing or whatever they uh, may be doing in that day and age. But what does it say? Have wisdom and have understanding so that you can calculate. What are they, what's, what's the, uh, John trying to say here? What's the Lord trying to say here in this passage? So that you can calculate the number of the beast. Why is that? Well, the fact of the matter is whoever receives the mark of the beast during the tribulational time period will not be allowed into heaven, and they will not be saved. It's very interesting. It seems like the only time in human history where somebody, if they do something, is going to nullify their entrance into heaven. 
And it almost reads, and again, we can only uh, uh, you know, have supposition here, and I'll come back and explain in just a minute. But the way it reads is that if you receive the mark of the beast, you will not be saved and you will be in the lake of fire for all of eternity. This is another study for another day. Don't want to go into too much detail, all right? We've got more things to talk about today, all right? But that's the fact. And it almost seems like if you were a believer and you received the mark of the beast you would end up in the eternal lake of fire. You would lose your salvation. But I find that hard to believe because nowhere in the Bible does it say anybody loses their salvation and we have eternal security. So the fact of the matter is, again, the supposition we can assume is that only the unbeliever will receive it. But again, Scripture isn't, isn't clear on that. We'll know during the tribulation when we see it all play out from heaven because that's where we're going to be, all right, because of the rapture. But the fact of the matter is it's a very important thing. And if you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to be condemned to the eternal lake of fire for the rest of eternity. And you can not and will not be saved. And it's going to be like a last-ditch effort or decision that you have in your life to either accept Jesus Christ or reject Jesus Christ and believe and follow the Antichrist. And in that uh, situation, you're going to be more concerned about your physical life, being able to buy and sell, have bread on the table, and live a humanistic physical life than you are about your spiritual life, and therefore you're going to receive the mark of the beast. You see, the fact is, is that it, we all, uh, those people will have a choice. What's more important to you, your physical life or your spiritual life? You see, in the tribulation, if you don't receive the mark of the beast, you'll be beheaded. You will die. You will be killed. And that's where people are going to be martyred for their faith because they reject receiving the gospel, excuse me, receiving the mark of the beast because they believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to these people who receive it, they're putting as more important what? Their physical life and their physical needs than their spiritual life. But the fact is, for those who do not receive the mark and take this warning wholeheartedly and calculate the number of the beast that comes out to be 666, it will be clear to them what they are receiving. And so therefore, if they say no to the mark of the beast, they have made a choice that my physical life is not more important than my spiritual life. And my spiritual life is so much more important that I am not going to receive the mark of the beast. And in fact, the people who receive the mark, they'll receive life, physical life, but they're going to lose their spiritual life. The ones who do not receive the mark of the beast, they're going to lose their spirit, physical life, but they're going to gain their spiritual life. In, in other words, they're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so it's very interesting that here and with the mark of the beast, it's the only two times this word calculate is used because it's very important for the be believers of the tribulation to make a good and wise decision. It's very good for all the people of the tribulation, believer and unbeliever, to make a good and wise decision as to whether they're going to receive the mark or not receive the mark. And it's a life or death issue. Now, as we take it back uh, to uh, building a tower here in uh, Luke chapter 14 and being a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's kind of the same thing, but in the spiritual realm. And the fact is, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to do what? Be ready to give up all that there is in this world, calculating the cost that you might have to give up everything in this world to follow Jesus Christ. And remember, either mentally or physically whatever the case may be, whatever God's plan might be for your life. And we have to make that choice and be ready to make every choice, especially physically giving up things. Being in the prosperous nation that we are, it's very hard for people to want to give up their stuff and the physical and material things of this world so that they can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to be ready, willing, and able to give it all up and follow Jesus Christ each and every day doesn't mean you're going to have to give those things up because you can follow Jesus and still be blessed in great material blessings, okay? But you're not placing them priority over your relationship with God and you're doing the work that God has for you. You're serving, you're worshiping, and you're utilizing your spiritual gift in a fantastic way as he has designed for you to do. And as I said, it's a life or death issue. 
And for those who don't want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, they're choosing what? The human life, the physical life, Satan's cosmic system life. They're, uh, they're, they're accepting the old life of the old man, the old sin nature. But those who are ready, willing, and able to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, they're giving up that life so they can gain the spiritual life and be a disciple of Jesus Christ and go forward inside of his plan. So calculating all of this, we have to recognize the cost of being a disciple. We have to place things in lesser value than we do in regard to our relationship of Jesus Christ. And we say God the Father as well and following them each and every day. And we have to recognize that the things of this world are unimportant when it comes to our discipleship and following Jesus. And there's no coincidence that I had a conversation with my good friend, Pastor Bill Wenstrom today, who's here tonight. And we talked about how you have to give up everything to be a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone that has given up everything for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it's Pastor Bill Wenstrom. And he has given up everything so that he could follow Jesus Christ. And is just barely getting by, as you know, most pastors are, just barely getting by on a day-in and day-out basis to, so that they can continue to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is faithful and continues to provide just what we need each and every time so that we can go forward inside of his plan. But Bill calculated the cost. I calculated the cost when we get into the ministry, as you all should calculate the cost as being a disciple of Jesus Christ and be ready, willing, and able to give it all up so that you can follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, mentally first and then physically if necessary. So we've got to calculate that cost and recognize what it means. And that's where most believers fall down. And that's why Jesus Christ turned to the crowd. A lot of people were following him. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, Messiah, Hosanna in the highest. All of this praise and worship. But they really didn't have it in their heart. And they were just looking for a miracle. Or even yet, they were looking to get something from him. They were looking for a benefit from Jesus. And you've seen that, and I've seen that, and Bill's seen that in ministry where, yes, you have a lot of great disciples who want to come and learn and serve and contribute. You know, there's this, I love John Kennedy's statement, and it's a great thing for the Christian you know, mind in the Christian world. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Like as Christians, ask not what you can do for your church, but, excuse me, what uh, your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. I almost got that backwards, right? Okay. But most people come to church, not most people, some people come to church, look, Looking for what they can get from the church. You see, they don't want to be contributors to the church. They want to get something from the church. They want to get something out of it. And that something that they want to get out of it is not the mind of Christ when they have that mentality. Okay? The people who come to serve God and to serve the church, again, they, uh, they serve and they contribute where they can. And in the result of that, they receive much more as a result. And God fills their heart with the word of God. So, again, we ought to consider everything as loss in regard to our relationship with Jesus Christ, just as Paul did in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this, but it never hurts to see these things time and time again to remind ourselves because, you know, we get ourselves in positions and uh, places and uh, sometimes uh, uh, difficulties and, you know, we forget the scriptures or we're not reminded of the scriptures. And so it's always good to go back and see these things so that we can recognize what it means to have a great relationship with Jesus Christ and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and how we get so much more out of it than we do in, uh, uh, putting into it. But the fact is, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul said, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel. Again, the chosen race, the chosen people of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the great of the 12 tribes of uh, Judah. Oh, excuse me, uh, of Israel. <coughs> excuse me, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he was a great scholar. As to the law, a Pharisee. Again, I knew the law inside and out, and I was, had leadership responsibility within that. So he had all the earthly things going for him, especially inside the religion that he was uh, uh, previously serving in. 
And then he says in verse 6, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. I kept the law, okay? Even though no one is righteous by just keeping the law. Now in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You see, that's what it's all about. You may think that you're giving up a lot. You may think you're giving up this. You may think you're giving up that and how difficult that may be. But believe you me, and even as Paul recognizes, he gave up everything, all the power and authority and responsibility that he had. Again, he saw it all as rubbish and trash in regard to his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it is, not only in time, but for all of eternity. Because remember, whatever we're giving up is just material stuff that's part of this world that will all be burnt up one day. But your relationship with Jesus Christ is going to go on forever and ever and ever. So again, we should be willing to cal first calculate the cost of what it means to be a disciple and then being very motivated once we determine that calculation. And again, we put it on a scale and we say, okay, here's what I'm going to lose in this world. Here's what I'm going to gain by being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what happens? The scale tips. And again, the hand going up is a bad thing on the scale. The hand going down is a good thing, okay? More weight there, more things there, more value there. You see, having a relationship with Jesus Christ is far more valuable than anything this world could offer and everything that this world could offer you. All right, let's go down to verse uh, 29 now. Now in verse 29, all right, turn, you can turn back to Luke chapter uh, 14. All right, uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 29, it says, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him. Here what we're seeing is the consequences of not being a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and instead choosing to follow the world. And there are consequences, and it's kind of interesting as we uh, go through this, and I'll get the scriptures and uh, explain what this is all about as we go through it, but there are consequences of not calculating the cost. In other words, by not determining that, okay, for me to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I have to give up X, Y, and Z in my life. And again, make those things a lesser priority than my relationship with Jesus. That's what I have to do to be a disciple of His. If someone is not willing and able to do that, they never will be a disciple of Jesus. And isn't it interesting that actually the word that we're using here for disciple, mathetes, is only used in the Gospels and the book of Acts. The only time it's used. It doesn't go in to the epistles. Kind of interesting. But it does talk about the disciples of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about the 12 disciples, 11 of which became the 12 apostles, and then uh, uh, including Paul, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But those 12 that Jesus Christ called, and we'll, we'll talk the 11, again, excluding Judas Iscariot. But as Jesus called them, what did he say? Drop what you're doing and follow me. And they had businesses, and they had family, they had friends, they had material things. And Jesus Christ said, drop what you're doing and follow me. And they all did. And as a result, those 12 individuals, Paul and the 11 disciples, uh, uh, apostles uh, uh, before Jesus' death and resurrection, those individuals are going to be blessed fantastically for all of eternity. And in fact, the New Jerusalem has uh, their names on the gates, right, in the New Jerusalem as a memorial to their faith and their discipleship for all of eternity. So a fantastic thing and a blessing. But not only are they just going to be memorialized in that way, but in the mentality of their soul and their, their physical and spiritual being that will go forward for all of eternity is going to have special blessing that will carry with them forever and ever and ever. And that's what it will mean for you and I as well as we become disciples of Jesus Christ and stay as disciples of Jesus Christ until he takes us home. There's going to be tremendous blessings and rewards in the eternal state that we can't even describe. We can't even talk about what it's actually going to be. We've got some humanistic things about material type of things because that's what we can kind of grab onto. But we truly 
can't recognize and understand in the mentality of our soul what it's going to be like other than it's going to be unbelievable and it's going to be awesome and it's going to be fantastic for all of eternity. And there are going to be differences. In fact, as uh, the book of Corinthians chapter 15 talks about star differing from star in the resurrection body. You know, the bright shining star is not just going to be burning brighter so that people can see them from more of a distance and see more of the reflected glory of Jesus Christ. They're going to be experiencing that too in their entire being in resurrected form. But the one that's just a barely dim little pinprick of a light way off in the distance, they're going to have some glory and some great experience, but it's only going to be a little tiny bit compared to what they otherwise could have had for all of eternity. So again, uh, you know, we see the fantastic results of having a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here in time that will carry with us to the eternal state. And that's why, again, and we're going to see in just a minute in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we see the gold, silver, and precious gems, the rewards that we can have in the eternal state. But other believers, theirs will be burnt up. And they'll have no reward. They'll be saved, but there'll be no reward in the eternal state. So the foundation we lay uh, in regard to our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the foundation we lay in regard to building the tower here is very important. And it all starts with Jesus Christ. And we talk about that foundation. We understand the foundation. It is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But unfortunately for some people and uh, people in religion and for people who are outside of the Christian religion as well, they're laying their life on another foundation. They're laying it on some person or some, uh, some doctrines or some principles or precepts. Or even in the, uh, Christianity, in the religious world, they're laying their foundation based on what? Their works and their deeds, not Jesus Christ. But it's very important that we lay our foundation on the person and work of Jesus Christ with his word resonant within our soul. So, as it says, otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him. So the foundation we lay must be laid in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That also is spoken about in Luke chapter 6, verses uh, 48 and 49. That is also paralleled in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 27. Let's turn back to Luke in Luke chapter 6. <coughs> when we studied this some time ago, and uh, when we studied Luke chapter 6, and here specifically in verses 48 and 49, and then Matthew uh, you know, parallels it with a slightly more emphasis. <coughs> But now go back to verse, uh, of, of verse 47 uh, just for some context. It says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts upon them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when the flood rose and the torrent burst against that house, and it and could not shake it because it had been well built. Again, that's talking about our soul, building it on Jesus Christ and his word on a consistent basis. Now, verse 49. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house upon the ground. And in Matthew, it says upon the sand without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. So again, with the individual who's not building on Jesus Christ, they're not going to have what it takes to withstand the trials and tribulations of the difficulties of everyday life. They're not going to have what it takes to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, whether it be the Bama seat or the, the great white throne, to withstand that judgment. And there's going to be loss. It's going, uh, you know, all that they thought they had is going to be lost and torn down. But as we understand the one who builds his house on worldly things as its sub-foundation, as it were. Again, has a tower. He's laying it on the foundation. Here we see building upon a rock versus building upon sand. Again, that sub-foundation that you lay the great foundation on. Again, if you don't do that appropriately, and it's not based on the word and mind of Jesus Christ, then again, you're on, as they call, sinking sand. 
And your house is not going to be built up. Your edification complex of your soul is not going to be built. It's not going to be strengthened. And you will not grow in spiritual maturity. And unfortunately, the, as uh, Luke said back in chapter 6, when the difficulties come, the whole thing's going to fall down. You're not going to have faith. You're not going to have strength. You're not going to have the power to withstand the problems and difficulties of life. Now, as we're talking about in Luke chapter 14, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, it also has the connotation of a foundation. And that the believer who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior has a foundation of Jesus Christ, and they are saved. But then they say, well, wait a minute. Do I really want to be a disciple of Jesus? Do I really want to follow him? Do I want to take his word in consistently? And in that, do I want to give up this nice, cozy life that I have here on planet Earth? Do I want to make Jesus my number one priority and these things less priority? And typically they're saying no to those things. And as a result, they're not building the edification complex of the soul and they don't become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, here we're just talking about discipleship, but back in Luke chapter 6, we see the whole realm not being able to live the spiritual life, not having the strength and power and necessary resources in the spiritual life to be an overcomer, not having the full armor of God to withstand the flaming arrows and missiles of the evil one. You cannot stand firm if you don't have a good foundation and continue to build it every day. And in fact, the connotation that we have here, as I said earlier, this is a consistent walk. This isn't something you, that you do, you're a believer, and for five years you study, and ah, I've arrived, okay, and now I've got all I need, and now I'm, I'm a tower, and I'm good, okay, and then just level out a plateau. No, this is a consistent walk. It's like you're always building the tower. You're building and building and building, or you're letting God build and build and build inside of you. And you're letting him continue to go uh, and grow the word of God in your soul so that you are stronger each and every day. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just before it talks about, you know, the gold, silver and precious gems that the disciple will receive in the eternal state. It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. So again, we have a warning about building and building that tower or the edification complex of the soul. In verse 11, it says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, there's no way to build up your soul in the spiritual realm absent your relationship with Jesus. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. Again, salvation's free, but it's another thing to follow Jesus and be a disciple of Jesus and have his word resonant within your soul. And that's what we need to strive for and to achieve in our daily walk, striving more and more to know the word of God, have Bible doctrine in our soul so that we go forward. And we laid the foundation already in salvation. We believed in him for our salvation. Now continue to build for your everyday life looking with the eyes to the eternal state of what it means to live the spiritual life. Because already you're living the resurrection life. Already you're living the spiritual life that will carry with you for all of eternity. So build that life. Enhance that life. Grow that life. Rather than growing the earthly, uh, cosmic one that is filled with material stuff here on planet Earth that you can't take it with you, as we say all the time. Okay, You can't take it with you when you get to the eternal state. But the spiritual, you can take that with you. So the fact is, if we do not calculate the cost of following Jesus, you will not be able to see it through to its completion. Why? Because of the poor planning. And that's what we have here. The poor planning. This man, oh, I've got a vineyard. I've got to build a tower so I can protect my vineyard. And I have a place for the harvest. And I have a place of refuge, you know, during harvest season, whatever the case. And he starts to build. And he gets so, so far. And he can't go any further. And even though he's built a little bit, really, what good is that when the enemy comes in? What good is that when someone comes and tries to take over his vineyard? What good is that when sin tries to overwhelm his soul? It's no good at all. And again, yes, you're saved, but you don't have the power and the strength and the resource to overcome whatever that sin might be in your life or whatever, you know, that enemy may be that's trying to knock you down or the torrent that's coming to try to blow you over. The big bad wolf, as it were, as he huffs and he puffs and he tries to blow your house down, okay? 
You don't have enough strength if you're not a true disciple of Jesus Christ because you don't have his word resonant within your soul. And that's why a lot of Christians fail. And as a result of not building the tower that you should within your soul, as we would say, not building the edification complex of your soul, there will be what? Shame at the Bema seat of Jesus Christ. As it says in this passage, and by analogy, Jesus says, the man who uh, went out to build and put the foundation up but couldn't do anything after that, he'll be ridiculed. And again, in the humanistic analogy by the people. Oh, look at that guy. You know, he started to build. And he didn't have enough building, you know, money to finish what he was doing. He didn't have enough resources. And he didn't calculate it through. He didn't think, you know, far enough or, you know, downstream enough to think about what he needs for all the resources and assets to build that tower so that he would be protected. What a fool he is. And so there's that ridicule. And by analogy, that brings us also back to the Bema seat of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, as we continue on in verses you know, 14 and 15, those who don't build on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and ultimately they try to build on their human good works, rather than building on the Word and their relationship with Jesus, their works are going to be burnt up, wood, hay, and straw. And there's nothing left, nothing but ashes. And there's nothing for all of eternity. And as 1 John chapter 2 in verse 28 says, and I've got that on the board for you here, it says, Now little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, again, at the resurrection of the church, and then we're uh, 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 with Him in the eternal state, and then we're going to stand before the Bema seat. It says, So when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. You see, the word shame and the ridicule are synonymous terms here. Again, having shame, again, as, as, as we have the ridicule here, a whole other aspect that I can get into right now that, uh, 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 that uh, gave in your notes, but not a lot of detail on the board. But that word for, for ridicule is also the word that is used for mocking in the New Testament and predominantly used in the Gospels for mocking Jesus Christ. Okay? So again, he will be mocked. And so when someone is mocked, what does that mean? They're being shamed. And so when we stand before the uh, Bema seat of Jesus Christ, if we didn't build our soul and follow Jesus as a true disciple, we're going to have loss of reward, wood, hay, and straw, burnt up, and we're going to have shame at his appearing because we're going to be embarrassed because we knew better, and we should have been building our soul. We should have been disciples of Jesus Christ. We should have been defeating our sin nature rather than giving over to it and living for it. And when Jesus appears, there's going to be shame at his coming. This is talking about the believer. We're not talking about unbelievers here. Believers only. And there will be shame. And that shame, you know, uh, will be a fleeting, you know, will be a moment in time when we are ashamed, but it also will have long-lasting results. Because you won't receive the gold, silver, and precious gems, the blessings in the eternal state. You won't be the bright, shining star. You'll just be a little speck somewhere off in the corner and, again, won't be having the true experience that you otherwise could have had for all of eternity. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, there won't be shame, and you will be blessed, and you will be rewarded for all of eternity. Now, as uh, I noted, Jesus Christ was mocked. That's the Greek word that we have here, and I, uh, the oreo. I love that word. Okay, the oreo. Okay. All right. So, uh, but that's the Greek word that we have here. It's not double stuffed either. It's just saying, okay, just get it? Okay. All right. But Jesus Christ was mocked. This word that we have here for ridicule, predominantly he's talking about when the Roman soldiers and the people mocked Jesus Christ as he was what? On his way to fulfilling God's plan for his life. And I find that as an interesting analogy because Jesus Christ was fulfilling God's plan for his life. He was a disciple of God the Father, fulfilling that plan to the perfection that it was. And he was being mocked by what? The earthly, the human, and those of Satan's cosmic system. The Roman soldiers and others who were mocking him as he was being whipped and beaten and other Jews uh, that were, uh, you know, uh, uh, ridiculing him, etc., etc. He was being mocked as he was fulfilling God's plan for his life. And so we see how the world mocks those or shames those who what? Are going forward in the plan of God. 
as Jesus Christ was doing that and as our great example in fulfilling God's plan to a T. Did it perfectly. But yet God blessed him highly and highly exalted him and in his humanity seated him at the right hand of the Father. So we have that analogy uh, now coming back to what we're talking about here. And so we see kind of the opposite analogy. If we don't go forward in the plan of God as disciples of Jesus Christ, there's going to be what? Loss, shame, and embarrassment when we get to the Bama seat of Jesus Christ. And there will be, quote-unquote, ridicule. Now, all the angels aren't going to stand around and laugh at you, okay, because you didn't do X, Y, Z. Now, this is a private combo between you and Jesus Christ. And this shame or this ridicule is going to be in your head, okay, and in your thoughts because you are going to see, I should have done more, I should have done more, I should have done this, I should have done that. And you have regret now because you didn't live the spiritual life you, the way you should have. So that's the ridicule that we're talking about here. That's the shame we're talking about here. But it's interesting how Jesus was fulfilling the plan of God for the spiritual realm. The world was ridiculing him. In our analogy, if we live for the world... And don't build the foundation and build the tower that we should. There's going to be shame and ridicule in the eternal state. And as we get to the Bema seat of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's see how much I get a good amount of time, so we'll keep going here. But I've got a lot more principles and precepts in regard to this. You see, what we understand here is that this, this, this did not hinder or deter Jesus Christ from going forward. The mocking of the world, the mocking of the people, it did not stop him. And you're going to have the mocking of the people. You're going to have people demanding you of your time, of your talent, of your treasure, of the worldly way. And they're going to want, 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 want from you. And that's why, again, you have to step back and say, you know what? Less a priority. God's my number one priority. Here's my focus. Here's where I'm going. Here's uh, what I'm going to have as my A number one priority within my life. And these other things can take a back seat. Maybe I'll get to them. Maybe I won't. But I'm not going to place them over my relationship with Jesus Christ. As Jesus Christ was mocked, it did not hinder him from completing the plan that God had for his life. He calculated the personal cost that it would be to him. He was God in all his glory, and he became man and was ridiculed and abused by members of the human race that he created. Isn't that ironic? Okay? Isn't that ironic? And so that's what we understand is that even though he was mocked by them, he continued to go forward. Even though the world didn't want him to do what he did, he continued to go forward. He saw as more important his relationship with God the Father than he did with anything of the world. He could have cowtailed to the Pharisees and got their blessing. He could have cowtailed to Pilate and got his blessing. He could have played games with Herod and got his blessing and maybe even took over the throne. Could have done all those things. But that wasn't the plan that God had for him because it wasn't an earthly plan. It was a spiritual and a heavenly plan, and that's what he chose. And he gave up all. He calculated the cost, and he lived it. That's why in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he did what? Endured the cross. And what did he do? Despising the shame. And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus Christ calculated the cross, uh, calculated... Uh, what it would mean to be a disciple. And he endured the cross, knowing the suffering and the beating. Even though, you know, he was God incarnate, he knew what he would have to endure and suffer. He knew he would have to take on the sins of the entire world and did it anyway. He knew it. He calculated the cost. And he did what? Despise the shame. He knew the cost. He knew the shame. He knew what he would have to suffer. He despised all of that. In other words, he had it as a less priority. He put it all behind him. Didn't care about it one iota because what was more important to him was fulfilling God's plan for his life. And as a result of that, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As God, he's already on that throne as well as the Holy Spirit, but now as a member of the human race and his humanity, seated at the right hand of the Father in great blessing and a great honor for all of eternity in uh, hypostatic union as the God-man.
So we too should prepare ourselves and endure to run the race that God has set before us. There's a, a plan that God has for our life. Paul uh, gives it to us in the analogy of running the race. And we ought to run that race as if to win. And we can all win as we have a race, as it says. And we're going to read it in just a minute. There's typically only one winner in a race. But in God's race, every one of us can win. Because you have one race for your life, and that is your life. And you're not competing against anybody. You see, you're your own competition in the race that God has for the plan for your life. And it's you against you. It's you old man against you new man. Who's going to win? Who's going to run faster? Are you going to let the old man run faster and win that race and the cosmic race and the sinful race in your life? Or are you going to let the new man win the race and allow the word of God and the spiritual life to control and dominate and lead you each and every day? And so we should be preparing so that we run the race as if to win. And as a result of that, there won't be any shame at the Bema seat of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, and this will be our last uh, passage for this evening. Now, I'm also going to show you Hebrews on the board, but the last one we'll turn to. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. Again, we have an interesting analogy here, too, at a number of different uh, levels. Uh, but let's start in uh, chapter 9, now in verse 24. In verse 23, Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. It says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And as I said, there's one race that you have to run, and the only competition in that race is you, the old man versus your new man, who's going to win. That's the race you have to, won, uh, to, to, to run. Okay, All right, now in verse 25, it says, And everyone who competes in the games, and we're talking about the ancient you know, Olympic games, as it were, exercise self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as to, as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, let me just talk about that disqualification. A lot of people like to say, there it is, you can lose your salvation. No, 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 no. Okay? You see, to be disqualified in the ancient games was what? Shame and ridicule. You didn't win. And it also meant that you didn't have the wreath that you could take back to your hometown and show off as, you win, uh, as a winner. You didn't have the ability to go back as a hero to your hometown and say, look, I won the race or I won the competition. And as a result, you go back to town with what we would call loss of reward. And you had none. And so when it says here at the end, I have preached to others, I myself should not be disqualified. What's this talking about? Disqualification means he doesn't have the prize. And instead, he's got the shame that goes along with it. And see, Paul didn't want to have shame at the bema seat of Jesus Christ by not receiving the crowns and the blessings and rewards because he fulfilled the plan of God for his life. He wanted to run the race because his motivation was his relationship with Jesus Christ, not about getting the rewards, but his relationship, but knowing full well the promises that God had given, that if you run that race and you win that race, there are blessings for you both in time and the eternal state. All right, and that's why we also have in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And again, there's a lot of eyes watching us as we uh, live the spiritual life. And again, we talk about the Old Testament uh, heroes in this case and how, you know, they're part of the cloud of witnesses. Again, we could say angels are watching us and observing us too because they are. And they want to see how we live the spiritual life. It says, Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Again, 
Put off the old sin nature. Die to the sin nature. You've already died to it. Now keep it dead. Keep it in the closet. Keep it out of your life. The sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And that's what it means to be a disciple of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To run the race that God has set before us. To fulfill the plan that God has for our life by making Jesus Christ our number one priority. And when we do, then we are disciples of Jesus Christ. But if we don't and we go back and choose the world's way of doing things, then unfortunately we are not a disciple of Jesus Christ and we have loss of reward. So as we go forward inside the plan of God, we've got to make sure that we continue to go forward. Let's just go back to Luke chapter 14 real quick. And on Thursday, we'll uh, finish up, but we'll start with verse 30 and then uh, get into the, uh, the next uh, object lesson here about a king going out to battle. And here's the ridicule saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And you see, we don't want to be the person that's not able to finish. We've started the race. We believed in Jesus Christ. Let's now run the race as if to win. And let's beat back that old sin nature, that old man that is inside of us so that he doesn't win the race or she doesn't win the race. But let the new man, the new nature, let he or her win that race and win it as being a disciple of Jesus Christ because there are great blessings as a result of doing so. And whatever you give up in time, there will be so much more blessing as a result in the eternal state compared to what you had to give up in time. So don't worry about the things of this world, but have your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. All right, let's close in uh, prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the great example of your son, Jesus Christ, and being the greatest disciple of all time. And help us to emulate that uh, and him more and more each and every day so that we can be his disciples as we learn from our teacher as his great student so that his word is resonant within our soul and we too glorify you in all that we do. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you give us travel blessings on the way home this evening. In Christ's name, amen.